Hello, this is Catherine at I Know I Need to Stop Talking. Hello, loves, how are we doing? God, it's fucking mayhem here. It's absolutely fucking mayhem. I mean, even just on a localised level this morning, I am in the middle of cooking a roast dinner because it's Sunday. This is why I do the podcast on a Saturday, so I don't have the mayhem of roast dinner to contend with. I'd give anything for the simplicity of a little Ocado truck turning up right now. No, so I'm trying to cook a roast dinner and in my finest Delia moment, pulled out the oil with which I was about to make the roast potatoes and discovered it was sesame oil. Now, I'm not a cooking expert expert but I do think that sesame oil roast potatoes might taste odd so Beth came to the rescue she's my hero we ran up to the corner shop together and she rushed in and got me some olive oil so we can all rest assured potatoes are in the oven fuck I hope this isn't some like portent of how my Christmas cooking is going to go on Christmas day although I can say with a high degree of certainty I will not be attempting to multitask cooking Christmas dinner with with doing the podcast I mean that would be that'd be quite the experience wouldn't it that would be quite the experience I don't think anybody's anybody's ready for that um I hope everybody's doing okay it's it's very discombobulating at the minute isn't it I mean it always is discombobulating this time of year compounded massively this year by fucking covid fuck off covid fuck off just feel very irritated although i do like that i've learned far more about the greek alphabet than i ever imagined that i might but yeah it's it's very discombobulating nobody entirely knows what's going on it's very difficult i find to make plans for anything because obviously cases are rising and there's lots of lots of people on my social media time timelines playing that delightful festive game of lateral flow Russian roulette, like will it be positive, will it be negative, are my plans cancelled, are they not, who knows. So I thought we'd just have a bit of a, a bit of a respite from all of this, a little bit of a break, and in my, this is my last podcast before Christmas, goodness me, I just thought it'd be nice to feel a bit festive. And for me, there is nothing like feeling festive, like it's all those little traditions, those little moments over the years, because... The media like to make Christmas as this big thing, mainly so that they get us to spend loads of money, which I, you know, I understand the, their logic behind doing that. But for me, Christmas is magical. I love Christmas now at the age of 40, every bit as much as I loved Christmas as a child, even despite hashtag Ratgate. For anybody who doesn't know what I'm talking about in respect to Ratgate, let me briefly recap the moment that I shared on the blog this week. So, Ms. Trino, I need to stop talking. I sat on the sofa one evening this week in front of our Christmas tree and Beth's been coming back from school and getting little presents like chocolate coins and stuff from her friends. And I am quite militant when it comes to Christmas presents are for Christmas Day. Oh, it's all fun and games in this household. So I said to her, put them under the Christmas tree, darling. We will open them on Christmas Day. And actually, she's she's pretty good these years. I clearly drummed it into her over the last 11 years. So she's been putting these presents underneath the tree and the cats have been watching her. Now, Sandwich is an old lady and lovely and she's not going to cause us any bother and Brexit is mostly too motivated about eating to do anything clever. But ASAP, ASAP is smart. ASAP watches and ASAP is smart. And thus it was as we were sat one evening this week watching television by the Christmas tree. ASAP came running in and ASAP's the smallest of my cat. She's really little. She's quite skinny. She's classic oriental type cat in, in shape. She came racing in with the world's largest fuck off rat clenched between her jaws and I'm not fucking joking this thing was like half the size of her it was so massive fair play to her for catching and killing it and it was dead thank god because you know otherwise this could have been like the worst retelling of the night before Christmas not a creature was stirring yes it fucking was there was a huge fuck off rat running amok around my living room uh it was so large that she couldn't really lift it she had to kind of half drag it on the floor and so she brought it in she looked at Mr I know I need to stop talking and I and then, without hesitation, she raced over to the Christmas tree and dropped the rat underneath the Christmas tree next to Beth's presents because she had learned from watching us that that is what you do with Christmas presents and she fucking terrifies me. Absolutely terrifies me. So then we called the kids down. Look what Aesop's brought you as a present. Jamie was on cat duty on that particular day and Jamie, as always with the cats, is a joy. Fuck's sake, idiots, what have you done? What have you done? What's the matter with you, idiots? Oh, love him, love them. So yeah, so who doesn't make Christmas feel like Christmas when you find a dead, fuck-off, huge rat? It's the tails. I don't mind rats, dead or alive. But those tails, that's like a desire. I mean, if you were, if you were making a rat, you'd be like, no, that's just too fucking grim. No, let's change it to something pink and fluffy. Yeah, they're very, very odd and slightly sinister rat tails. Anyway, those little magical moments, just just like that one. But I was reading, I can't remember why I was reading it. Somebody was doing like nostalgic Christmas moments. And for me, Christmas always started with Blue Peter and the 
fire hazard from hell that was their advent wreath. And you probably have to be of a certain age to, to, to remember this, but for, for the younger amongst my listeners, Blue Peter, which still runs to this day, and I'm assuming they probably still do an advent wreath. I hope to God it's slightly, slightly more health and safety conscious than, than the one from my youth. They basically used to get two wire coat hangers, kind of twist them together, wrap some highly flammable tinsel around them, and then shove four candles into the middle of that. And I dread to think how many house fires the Blue Peter Advent wreaths were directly responsible for. But yeah, they were seeing them make and light the Advent wreath. That was, that was for me, that was the start of Christmas. I, I think maybe I, I probably got a bit too into it. I mean, I, I quite often said to my mum, oh, we should make one of those. And my mum, probably torn between, you know, the Venn diagram of it looks like shit and it's going to set our house alight was like, no. So she did let me have an an advent candle alongside the advent calendar, which, you know, back in the day was a poorly drawn picture behind a cardboard door and you were bloody grateful. None of this, Jamie's got a cheese, a cheese advent calendar right now. That's my idea of hell because I hate cheese. I'm sorry, cheese lovers. I hate cheese, the idea of of daily cheese. But yeah, he's he's well happy with that. But yeah, as well as our, our, our cardboard advent calendars, we had an advent candle and the idea was that every day you would burn down the the little bit of candle which is you know it's quite a nice thing to do I mean it takes some severe concentration kids are today with their multitasking would never manage it down you'd be down to Christmas Eve before you knew it but I remember one day going to light the advent candle and managing to lean over it and the sheer terror of a strand of my hair suddenly catching a light I mean fortunately it went out as quickly as it as it went alight and I think at that moment I knew the true terror of being a piece of tinsel on the Blue Peter advent wreath it was fucking terrifying so yeah um magical magical moments that probably are best consigned to to the 1980s as I say on the grounds of, of health and safety but we were really lucky as kids we we had the best Christmases and I know that you know these days people are are, are shockers at only showing sort of the highlights reel on on Christmas and and perhaps for obvious reasons I'm you know I've had some shit Christmases as well I'm not going to talk about those today because it's miserable for me and it's probably fucking miserable for, for you too but certainly as a kid we had the best Christmases my mum and I'm sure lots of people think this about their mums my mum did the best Christmases ever and you know I'm sure my I'm sure my dad played an active part I'm laughing at the my memories of you know kind of the, like the percentage split of Christmas preparation which was like 99.99999% my mum and then the 0.0001% which was me and my dad going out in a panic on Christmas Eve to get the presents that my dad had had forgotten to get every year it was a beautiful beautiful Christmas tradition and those moments of magic that you have as a kid at Christmas I can still remember now I can literally remember this so vividly so I would have been it was in the house before the main house that was my childhood home so I must have been I'm going to say six or seven at a guess. And we lived in the little village where I grew up and it was, you know, lovely neighbourhood. Everybody was was very friendly. Lots of older people living in the street where we lived and they loved, you know, the fact me and my sister were kids at Christmas and all the magic and excitement. And I will never forget on what must have been Christmas Day morning, my dad calling me over to the window in our house, which faced out onto the main street. I'm going, Catherine, come here, come and look at this, come and look at this, look who's here. And I can still remember... I don't even know what emotion I felt when I looked out the window and saw that Father Christmas was in my actual street, on a sleigh, with presents. Like, literally, there are no words to describe how that feels. Oh, it was amazing. Just to be clear, wasn't the actual Father Christmas. He's probably gone back home for well-deserved sleep. He'd had a busy night. It was our elderly neighbour, Bill, who had dressed up as Father Christmas with children in the street. And I think because it was so unexpected and so magical, that was like one of the best magical moments of all. I mean, you know, I'm not going to lie, the magic does fade a little bit. I mean, you go through that 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 thing of, and, and any kids, just to be really clear... Santa is categorically real and the magic of Christmas is absolutely a real thing and doesn't matter how old you are you should always believe in the magic of Christmas but I remember when I got to the point that I certainly worked out that that Father Christmas was perhaps not working alone let's put it like that and it's all down to wrapping paper all down to wrapping paper and my and my mum not unreasonably because perhaps she wasn't you know taking that she had like Sherlock Holmes apprentices as in her children like trying to work out what was going on she had used the same wrapping paper to wrap our presents from her and my dad 
as the wrapping paper that was used for some of the stocking presents. I'm like, come on, come on, that's a basic, that's a basic. So much so now that even now, when I buy for my kids, I'm, there's always at least two or three different types of wrapping paper going on because I'm just saying, the chances of Father Christmas and my mum being in the same shop at the same time buying the same wrapping paper? I don't think so. He's got elves printing his wrapping paper. Come on, come on, try harder. But yeah, I remember that was definitely a key moment of going, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe Santa's got some got some helpers in the forms of forms of the mums and dads. And yeah, suddenly a newfound appreciation for God. My mum was working even harder than I thought she was. And I also remember the, the, the magical moments, the certain magic moments, aren't there, when you when kind of like key presents. And it was never big presents. We, we didn't do big presents. I look at some of the stuff that like families and kids get and I'm like, wow, that's intense. And also that's a world away from, from what we did. It was lower key. I remember opening up on Christmas Day a stripy jumper in shades of yellow, blue and pink. It sounds hideous. I think it probably was hideous, but in my seven-year-old heart, I wanted that jumper more than I'd ever wanted anything ever. And when I opened that up and it was there on Christmas Day, having seen it in the shop and my mum said, oh, it's too expensive. Oh God, it was just magical. I bloody, bloody love it. Um, speaking of Father Christmas and stocking, so one of the things that happens as you get older, because I don't know about anybody else, I just assume that my way of doing Christmas is the right way of doing Christmas, and that's how everyone does Christmas. We had a discussion the other day at work, and one of my work colleagues was trying to claim that Christmas, when you have your, like, Christmas dinner, you have it at tea time. You don't have Christmas dinner at tea time. That's not Christmas tea... That's not Christmas dinner. Tea time on Christmas Day is leftover time. Christmas dinner should be eaten between the hours of 2 and 2.30 p.m. sharp. Yeah, I was I was shocked and outraged. But one of my greatest moments of shock came when I got together with Mr. I Know I Need to Stop Talking. And I think we spent the first few Christmases that we were together, actually not together, we were with our respective families. But somewhere along the way, I must have been talking about opening stockings. And, and he was like, what do you mean stockings? So, like, oh, you know, stockings, Father Christmas brings them on Christmas Day. No, it transpired in Mr. I Know I Need to Stop Talking's house. They never had stockings, even as a child. I know, right? And before you do the, oh my goodness, deprived, deprived, they just did it a bit differently. Basically, they kind of did all their presents. They get their presents in pillowcases. Again, I'm like, pillowcases? That's not a Christmas tradition, but it is in their household. And they, you know, they do all the presents in there. And then over the years, a, a tradition has evolved, which my kids have hugely benefited from because in their in their household in Mr. I Know I Need to Stop Talking's parents household they do something called Christmas tree presents which is on Boxing Day and it's kind of like stocking presents but instead of going in a stocking they go under a tree well my kids as you can imagine have embraced this vociferously because of course they now get fucking stockings tree presents on Christmas Day and then Christmas tree presents at Nana and Grandad's outrageous that's wrong no stockings it's very disturbing and, and don't get me started on Christmas dinner at tea time I'm asleep by tea time. There's no way I'd be I'd be having the energy to, to, to cook a roast. But you do you. As Jamie would say, you do you. December seemed to go on forever when you were a kid, didn't it? Like, it seemed to go on forever. Whereas now I'm recording this and I've just looked over at the date on my laptop. I'm going, fuck, it's the 19th of December. I still haven't done the fucking wrapping. Don't talk to me about the fucking wrapping. If there's one way to shit all over the magic of Christmas, never mind COVID, it's the fucking wrapping of fucking presents. But yeah, December seemed to go on forever. And again, those little traditions. We always used to do a 20p coin in the Christmas pudding, which I think back in the day would have been a silver sixpence, but obviously we'd, we'd gone decimal by then. It hasn't, got, it hasn't quite got the same ring, has it? 20p piece versus a silver sixpence. And um, my mum used to wrap it in foil, and I used to think it was so magical. How was it that whenever the first slice was cut for me, to be clear, my sister Helen didn't like Christmas pudding. It's not that Helen was being deprived of, of getting the Christmas pudding. I um, just want to make that clear, particularly if Helen's listening. And how was it that every time the first slice was cut, it automatically had the silver sixpence in it? How did that work? Obviously, now I know that my mum marked the Christmas pudding in some way, but still, it was magic. It was magical. We always used to set the Christmas pudding alight, which, again, I don't think Mr. I know I need to stop talking to family, do, because I think I, I remember a few years ago going to my mum's house for Christmas, and as, as standard, she lit, set the Christmas pudding alight. And Mr. I Know I Need to Stop Talking look, looked vaguely alarmed, perhaps not unreasonable given the amount of collective alcohol we'd drunk at the table and therefore how probably flammable we were as a family. Thank goodness we didn't have the Blue Peter advent wreath there. That's all I'm saying. Some some less festive memories as well, or, or no festive memories at all, like the year that I had full-blown flu on Christmas Day. That was shit. That was fucking shit. If you're poorly this Christmas, or any Christmas... I have so much empathy. I was so unwell, so unwell. That was a grim, grim Christmas. You see, we just don't share those highlights on social media. Um, 
another Christmas, my <laughs> my sister Helen, this is just really random. I hope you remember this as well, Helen. We were, or possibly not given what about, was about to happen. I suspect this might blank any memories. Helen must have been about nine and was obviously excited about Christmas as we all were. And I remember her running out of the lounge, I think to go towards the kitchen. But our kitchen door wasn't directly opposite the lounge door. It was slightly off to the left. And Helen just completely misjudged it and slammed headfirst into, into the wall. Festive. Very, very festive. Very, very, very festive. Christmas Day walk. Now, this is something where me and my family fall out because I love a walk, as you know, at any time of the year. But I particularly love a Christmas Day walk after lunch. You're a bit drunk. You've got two options. I think there's like a there's like a diagram at this point. You either go down the left hand route of drink more, possibly have a nap on the sofa and and then like start again. And I, ju I just end up feeling like shit and sluggish when I do that. Or regardless of the weather. And yes, this does include if it's pissing down, you put on some walking shoes and, and maybe a coat or maybe not because you're drunk. So you don't care. And you go out for a walk on Christmas Day and it never ceases to make me feel both better and very festive because everybody you see, it's like, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. It's like being in a Disney film, but without the singing. In fact, maybe this year I will do singing. If you see me on my Christmas Day walk this year, I may sing to you. God, my children are never going to come with me this year. That's definitely put the, the death knell on that one. But yeah, I love to walk and my family do not. So actually last year, which was our first Christmas at home, and we're doing the same again this year, we're at home for Christmas. It worked brilliantly. We had Christmas dinner. I'd cooked the Christmas dinner. I like to cook, so that was no bother. Then I left them all clearing up. I went for my Christmas Day walk and I feel like every single one of us thought we'd got a great deal in the process. So so there we go. Love a Christmas Day walk. But it's, it's those little moments. One of my happiest single Christmas moments ever was... I would have been, I don't know, 11, 12 maybe, and I'd got a new book for Christmas, Biggest Treat, Biggest Treat. I love a new book for Christmas. And after lunch, I remember, you know, my mum, understandably, was quite strict on don't gorge yourself on chocolate before the dinner, because I spent hours making this fucking dinner. You feckless so-and-sos eat the dinner, don't fill up on chocolate. But after dinner, like, the gloves were off, or basically my mum had had enough wine that it didn't really matter anymore. And so I just remember sitting on the chair in the house where my mum still lives now, and curling up in the chair with my book and a king-sized Mars bar and thinking, I don't think life gets much better than this. And actually, with the benefit of hindsight and, you know, recording this podcast as an adult doing adulting in a global pandemic, I would say to 11-year-old me, you were right, you were fucking right, that right there. You peaked, love. You absolutely peaked. I was brilliant. But then, of course, you become an adult and you realise that there are no Christmas elves and you have to do the whole thing yourself. Although I have to say, I have enjoyed working through Christmas as, as a parent. And I've had some good moments. I've had some moments along the way. But the one I would call out, my moment of parenting genius. And every year I give this to you, my listeners, because if it helps one person have the joy of Christmas mornings that I've had, it's worth it. I'm not very good at getting woken up particularly early. I say this with fervour, having been woken up at 6am this morning, not by the kids, they slept till like 11, but by Brexit, the absolute dick, that's the cat, not the leaving of the European Union, although both dick moves, and was on the new carpet, little fucker, new carpet outside of my bedroom, scratching away at the carpet. I mean, irritating on every single level. So yeah, I'm not good at early mornings. And I was horrified, kind of like in the run up to having children of my own, like seeing on social media, friends who were parents like going oh you know late start for us today we didn't get up till 3 30 3 30 fuck off i'd be livid although i wouldn't care if it was christmas i'd be livid people going oh a lovely lion this morning went up till five 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 that's like that's the middle of the night five so i was determined that i would have none of this shit with my children i should point out here in fairness I think Mr. I Know I Need to Stop Talking would be quite happy to get up at five, probably even 3.30. He loves Christmas, but I love nothing at that time of the morning. And so in a moment of unparalleled genius that I've possibly never repeated since as a parent, when Jamie was very little, we introduced the concept of Father Christmas. And on a whim, not really thinking it would work, if I'm honest, I said to him, obviously, you have to make sure in the morning you don't get up before it's light. This only works if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, by the way. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, you're fucked. I'm really sorry. I've got, I've got no solutions for you. Um, I said to him, you, you know, you mustn't get up before it's light. And he said, why? And I said, because if you get up before it's light, Father Christmas might not have had time to come and bring your presents. Again, this only works if you make sure your children's stockings are, are downstairs. I, I, this was like a strategic planning event. They were downstairs. I said, and if he, if he comes, you know, and finds that you're up and he hasn't left the presents, he won't come back. 
well, I might have scarred my children for life, but it's worked like an absolute fucking charm. I tell you, I've never, ever been woken up before 7.30 at the earliest, more usually 8. And last year, I think about 11 o'clock, Beth, like, went and forcibly jumped on Jamie to, to get him out of bed. I mean, it is different when they're, when they're teenagers. It is, it is definitely, definitely different. Um, but yeah, so if that helps one of you not to have a 3.30 start to your day, fuck that shit, then my Christmas gift from me to you. I haven't always been quite that successful. I did have the moment when once I think I'd been out that evening and the children were sleeping, were still in bed with us at the time, so they'd only be, be small. They, those were the days when, like, literally, I mean, it, my, my bed, it was like a fucking, it was like a bus on there. There was, like, constant people in and out of it. So the kids were asleep in that bed. And I'd obviously come up slightly worse from where for my night out and had, you know, got undressed and went to bed. The next morning, I found both the children gibbering in fear at the end of the bed and Jamie going, Beth, look! There's a half-eaten mince pie at the end of the bed. Santa's been, but he hasn't left presents. And that took quite a bit of un unwinding to say, no, that wasn't wasn't Santa. That was my mince pie at the end of the bed. Um, but again, good if you want to, like, you know, put a little bit of fear into kids. Are you on the naughty or the nice list? Let's hope you don't wake up to find a half-eaten mince pie at the end of your bed and no presents. Christmas, as a parent for me, seems to have become all about fear, I'm discovering as I, as I share these anecdotes with you. It definitely changes when they're, like, when they're young, they haven't got a fucking clue what's going on on any day of the week, let alone let alone Christmas. People used to ask me when Jamie was very little, what are you getting him for Christmas? And I was like, fuck all. And they were like, not getting him a present. I'm like, he, he thinks his own fist is a present. He like eats wrapping paper. No, he's not getting a fucking present. We did used to gift our children. Jamie particularly loved that, that like holographic wrapping paper. Oh my God, he used to vibrate underneath that with joy and excitement. He fucking loved it. We graduated. We did, you know, we did start getting them presents for quite a few years when they were very young. It was nappies, nappies and wipes and baby grows. Um, but yeah, I, I, I promise I do, do give my children gifts, gifts those days. I mean, wrapping is definitely a sore point in this household because I fucking hate it. I fucking hate it. But one of my biggest, without a shadow of doubt, my biggest fucking Christmas fail of all. I mean, this was right up there. So we used to, pre-COVID, and it'll come back again, we used to have friends over on Christmas Eve, which was both a nice social event to celebrate with our friends and also, really sneakily, it was a great way of getting some unpaid labour in to help wrap the presents that I would still have unwrapped. So it used to be lovely, we used to get drunk, have cocktails, send the children to bed, wrap the presents, and, and all was merry and bright. And that particular year, Mr. I Know I Need to Stop Talking had bought a new pen, not a Christmas present, he bought it for himself, and I think you probably know where this story is going. And I was drunk, wrapping presents with friends, and Mr. I Know I Need to Stop Talking had, was sitting, I think, at his desk, and I said, oh, can I borrow, can I borrow a pen? He's like, I've only got this pen. No, it's new. It's quite expensive. You'll lose it. And I was like, no, in, the, in like the arrogance of a drunk. Of course I won't lose it. How could you possibly say that, that I would lose this pen? And so I was kind of like flailing around. And in the end, I think probably anything for an easy life. He just said, okay, look, look, here's the pen. Please don't lose it. Of course I won't lose it, I said. Brought the presents. Said goodnight to my friends. They left, got the presents. And Mr. I know I need to stop talking. Said, where is my pen? And I went, oh, fuck off. I'd wrapped the pen, hadn't I? I'd wrapped the fucking pen. So that Christmas Eve night, I was up till two in the morning. I probably could have got up with somebody else's children and start the fucking day. Unwrapping and rewrapping every fucking present, searching for the fucking pen. Fucking hate wrapping presents. Ah, it's like my least festive part of Christmas. Least festive part. Um, but obviously it's worth it to see the joy and happiness in the recipient's faces as they rip off the fucking wrapping you've spent fucking hours doing. Ah, and of course the best presents, not usually, they're not usually ones you expect. I mean, when my kids were little, cardboard boxes, forget the toy. They just wanted the box. One of my favourites was somebody one year gifted Jamie some massive hairy stick on eyebrows and every single photo I've got of that year, it's Jamie with massive hairy stick on eyebrows. Um, it's, it's, it's superb. Chocolate orange, that's a festive classic, classic in our house. My dad, even now, while I'm 40, he still buys me a Christmas orange every year and I love it. Always a satsuma in the bottom of your stocking absolutely compulsory. I wonder if Mr. I know I need to stop talking to family had satsumas in their pillowcases. I shall find out. Pillowcases. Madness. But yeah, it's not always, it's not always the gifts you expect. It's sometimes it's those little, little, little moments. And, I, and I've definitely learned over the years, I think, about the stuff that really matters. And Christmas is actually one of those times where I think it does really polarise what matters. Probably no, never more than, than now. You know, it's, it's not the presents. It actually doesn't even need to be the day itself. And, and, I had quite a long learning journey curve to get to this point because 
my parents divorced when I was 21. Up until then, we'd been like the nuclear family. Perfect, happy Christmas. Um, so I had that going on. And Mr. I know I need to stop talking equally often when his children, my two stepchildren were, were younger, he didn't have them on Christmas Day. And, you know, we were kind of like we went together or I was at one parents and not the other parents. And I think it's safe to say there was quite a lot of angst on my part. And very nicely, he kind of explained it to me that, you know, Christmas Christmas is a period and it's, and it's coming together. It's a coming together over that festive period. But doesn't have to be Christmas Day. It doesn't even have to be December, right? You know, Christmas is it's, it is about the love. I know it's a bit cheesy, but it really is. It's about that love. It's about making sure even if you can't physically be together, taking that time to pick up the phone and, and call someone and tell them that you love them or, or buying that, that little gift that doesn't need to cost the world, but just show someone that you're, that you're thinking of them. But I think particularly this year, as I say, everything seems to be a bit up in the air at the moment. Lots of people's Christmas plans having to change last minute. And I, you know, it may or may not help, but I definitely went on quite a journey over the years. And now Christmas is what it is. It's, it's one day, right? It is one day. Um, and I say this as a practicing Christian who, you know, sort of marks, marks the Christmas period, but it's important, but it is one day. And actually, you know, we can we can break ourselves trying to make it perfect. And the reality is it probably never will be perfect. You'll probably not cook enough roast potatoes. I mean, God, don't do that in my house. There would, there would be like World War Three, you know, or, or, or you'll burn the turkey or you'll forget the nut roast or you'll have wrapped up a really expensive pen belonging to somebody else in the house. You know, I think we put too much pressure on ourselves. And I think particularly at the minute when it feels like a lot of stuff's out of our control. Right now, it's about doing your best taking time for you, having a lovely time. And like I say, don't stress the small stuff. And this year, probably even try not to stress the big stuff. And I appreciate plans changing is, is really, really stressful, but it really is, it really is all about, all about the love. And it's making sure that the people you love know that you love them and, and vice versa. Um, and watching Muppets Christmas Carol, of course, which is the best fucking Christmas film. And I will hear nothing to the contrary. Mr. I Know I Need to Stop Talking loves It's a Wonderful Life. And I would say we don't have too many major bones of contention between us as a family, but that film is not in my eyes a festive film. I know I'm a minority. I know lots of people love it, but come on, it's Mu your Muppets. Who doesn't love Muppets and songs, Muppets and songs. If there was a Muppets version of A Wonderful Life, I feel I might learn to, to love it, to love it more. And as I say, it won't always go to plan. And I think as parents as well, or, or anybody who's hosting, we, we stress about the impact on the kids, but I've told this story before, but it's probably a good place to, it's probably a good place to end, which is, when I was a kid growing up in, in the little village where I lived with my sister and my mum and my dad, our village was really fucking prone to power cuts. And I mean really fucking prone to the point that we had like an entire drawer dedicated to torches and candles and matches. And again, I suspect you know where this one is going. It's Christmas day. My mum, as I say, had worked like a Trojan getting everything ready and making it perfect. We'd had presents, we'd had champagne and canapes. We obviously hadn't had cha champagne, we were like children, but my parents had champagne, we'd probably had some schlur, love a bit of schlur at Christmas. And we were all sitting there and the dinner was on and it was probably about 12 o'clock, we were gonna eat at one and suddenly the power went off and it stayed off. And there was kind of like this little bit of stunned silence and I'm like, oh, what do we do now? And I can't imagine how my mum must have felt at that moment going, oh my God, I've got like, you know, the turkey's done and it's resting, but I've got no veg, we've got no potatoes, got under the gravy, I've got no power, what are we going to do? And so in the end, she and my dad phoned friends of theirs who lived at the other end of the village, who happened to have, here we go, gas, gas cooking. Oh yes, gas cooking. And so we made arrangements to arrange an impromptu Christmas gathering of the two families. We got our turkey. We, I imagine we had some kind of like, I mean, I'm sure we were quite a sight carrying turkeys and wine and schlur and presents and stuff up the road. We walked up the hill to the other end of the village and we had the most impromptu, relaxed, messy and a bit all over there, Christmas dinner and Christmas afternoon ever. And you know what? I remember walking back home very late that night under the stars with my dad holding his hand. He was pointing out random constellations, which probably don't even exist because he was drunk and he's not an astronomer. So um, yeah, ha happy memories. And thinking this has been one of my absolute best Christmases ever. And it really had not gone to plan in any way, shape or form. So sometimes I think perhaps the, the Christmases that we worry about the most, they can in a roundabout way turn out to be some of the very best Christmases of all. Whatever you're doing for Christmas, whoever you are with, have a lovely time. Be kind to yourself. Don't put too much pressure on yourself. It is one day. 
drink the drink, eat the cheese, oh, don't eat the cheese, eat the chocolate, eat the mince pies, have fun, make merry, but above all, kindness, kindness and love to, to all those around you, to, to the strangers that we come across who do so much to keep Christmas going, whether in retail, in our NHS, our frontline services, but most of all, kindness and love to you this Christmas time. Lots of love from me to you. Happy Christmas.